So this is going to be a Sasea Orochi Ascendant deck. This is more or less done on a relative budget. I will highlight the cards that make this deck expensive and basically tell you whether or not you kind of need to keep them in there. Now you're going to see the card count. This is actually going to be a little high. It's going to be 104. I will tell you what cards I would cut depending on whether I'm running the budget model or not because there's two very specific groups for that. So what this says is... 3-drop for a 2-3, that doesn't matter. Reveal your hand. If you have 7 or more lands, your hand flip it. When it flips, it becomes the entire cornerstone of the deck. Whenever a land you control is tapped for mana, add 1 mana of any type of that mana pool uh, with to equal to the same, equal to other lands with the same name. What that's going to become, and why that's going to be important, and what actually keeps this deck relatively cheap, I'm running currently 50 lands. 46 of which are basic forests, so they are the ones that trigger off this. Of the remaining ones, really quickly, Reliquary Tower. This card does come in handy. It is not the most backbreaking necessary card. However, it is worth the investment for this deck. The other three are the Mono Green Cycling Lands. You can run Blast and Landscape, but because it only produces colorless, it's not as important as these would be. Many times you'll play it early to get out the Ascendant. If not, if you draw them later, you simply cycle them because they're not going to trigger the essence. So, mana base out of the way. Let's go through some of the big cards first. So, Storm Cauldron. If you're going to make a cut, this is the community's divided on this very quickly. This is basically about a 2 to $3 card. Being able to play an additional land, awesome. But the penalty here of whenever a land is tapped for mana, return it to your hand. This works two ways. One, in getting this to flip because you can tap a couple lands... Bring them back to your hand to get up to 7, because getting to 7 is not as easy as you think it is. And then get this to flip, and then you can make a ton of mana. Cool. Being able to play 1 to 2 lands a turn, having them each make 5 plus, which this thing allows, it, this is not going to slow you, really. This is a build-around-me sort of card. When it comes out, you'll know whether or not you want to play it. Certain decks cannot handle this card. Anything without heavy artifact... Um, destruction uh especially you know some of the ones that um you know rely on very specific lands being played like gates anything with a lot of coming to play taps this one does a lot of damage to i like it it is not necessary it is a three dollar card another more or less three dollar card i'm going to tell you is basically almost necessary two to drop two to activate the draw card because you're going to have three forests in play every time i think about cutting it it just works almost every time. Being able to drop on turn two, activate on turn three, very important for what this deck wants to do. One of the things you'll see with this deck is that there's a lot of what do I do with my mana because getting seven lands into your hand means you don't have other cards there, so you need ways of getting out of it. Tower of Fortunes is not a very impressive card on the surface, but being able to draw four cards, drawing four deep is very important. With four lands in play, two lands tap to activate this obviously less lands the more lands you have in play that's how the essence works i really would not recommend cutting this this is a very kind of important card now horn of greed horn of greed pairs very nicely with storm cauldron because being able to play two lands a turn and repeatedly getting those extra draws very you know very impressive it basically gets you one land a turn gets everyone else one land a turn if you're not going to run Storm Cauldron, you probably can cut Horn of Greed, but as I run both, they kind of stay together. Seer Sundial works sort of with this, but this is a very budget um, card for the deck, and even upper tier decks still run it, because paying two, which with the essence isn't going to slow you much, every turn to get one extra card, perfectly fine. And there will be times where you get multiple extra lands, and we'll see, you'll see that as we go on. Now we're going to get into kind of into sort of like what do you do with your mana. These are like sort of like win cons. The, the one I don't like using the most, but is probably the one that is used the most, is the token strategy. I'm not saying I don't use it. I'm saying I don't feel like using it all the time. Big thing here, and you'll see in other versions, X cards. You want less X cards uh, um, than you would normally expect. I'll show you why in a few. Uh, Ant Queen, five, five, that's fine. Uh, it puts in an insect out for two mana. You really aren't going to beat that rate. Hero's Bane. Hard cost. That's important. Comes in. Basically, if this if this creature gets through, you just dump all your mana, pump him to ridiculous levels. He should basically be a one-shot if unblocked. And obviously, you'll feel it out. Be like, if someone's open, you swing in, you knock him out. Otherwise, the card will just sit there. Hydra Broodmaster. 
hard cost, which is important for 7.7. 7. This mon monstrosity cost, you'll see some that run uh, gelatinous genesis. That is the same cost as this, same effect basically. That makes slimes, this makes hydras. Put X, X, X green hydras into play. I like this better because it's dead less often off some of my X spells, whereas Gelatinous Genesis is a dead card if flopped off things like Genesis Wave. Wolfbriar Elemental, 4 mana, 4, 4, multi-kicker. Um, generally, you theoretically can kind of cut him, but you don't want to cut too many of these mass token generators as they're going to be your primary win con. It is a one-shot, however, making two twos over one ones does matter from time to time. A budget card, the Jade Mage, not the most impressive. Three mana for a 1-1 one, one compared to, say, the Ant Queen, not that impressive. But it plays well if you're running Vertiloth because he gives uh, Tree Folk and Saplings plus one, plus one. Uh, obviously, he, he's a one-time shot. He's basically a six plus X. It's playable. It's cheap. It does what it needs to do. It makes an army. It's an army in a can. You'll notice a couple of these, you know, these guys... Um, the Hydra Broodmaster, their army in a can. Once you cast them, they just put stuff out and one time shot and it works. Skull Monster, how you turn tokens into cards. That's very important. If you get to a stall where those tokens aren't going to do anything, those one ones, eat them. Absolutely eat them, draw into one of these big cards. I'll show you what I know how that works in a second. But there's very few cards like this. And it's not the ones where you draw a card for each creature in play. Those are usually spells. The reason this, this guy is important, one, financially cheap. These things are everywhere. And two, it gets bigger, meaning you also have a kill spell sitting around. So it has its own uses. This is going to be part of a package, the lands as creatures. So first and foremost, let's get one of the big ones out of the way. Come on. He costs eight bucks now, which I think is utterly ridiculous. If you want to put money in the deck, he is probably one of my top picks for what makes the deck awesome. His ability to turn any land, uh, his ability to do multiple over overruns. If you've seen him in play, you know he's very good. The big thing here, though, is eight bucks. That's kind of steep. I like, if you run him, I like running Mastercore because I like shooting other people's lands and just taking, mowing them down. Turning creatures into lands and then shooting them, awesome. Mastercore by itself can, you know, use your excess mana and every two mana is one damage. You can start mowing stuff down with that excess mana. It does a lot. The From the Vaults one is generally cheaper at around two bucks. It's cuttable, but if you're getting Kamal in there for eight, I would probably put the extra two in for that. Now, this one I would run kind of regardless, and you'll see when we talk about Genesis Wave. Uh, vigilance, land creature control, Vigilance, that part doesn't matter. It's a landfall. Whenever land enters play, you can have a, a target land become a 3-3 three, three with haste. That is very important because some of these land activators, example, Kamal, he does not give the land haste. So if the land was not already in play, it's not going to be able to attack this turn. If you are running the land creature package, this guy is a good card. It's not completely necessary, but I like it. It gives land, if you have six or more lands, you it and your land creature get plus two plus two. So it's an anthem. He just sort of uh, solidifies that plan. Does not need to be part of the package. That's what I really like about this card. X green green. You can have any land get X plus one plus one counters. It become you know it has haste. So basically, if you have nothing else to do, you can make one at the end of your opponent's turn, dump all your mana in there, and then comes your turn, make another one, and just attack with these enormous creatures. Now, let's go for some of the support cards before we start talking about some of the other big cards. Corsair of Crufix. It does not let you play extra lands, but it does let you play lands from the top of your deck. So it lets you dig a little bit deeper. One life for every land that comes in play on your side. That's decent. It's not a great card. For about two bucks, it's very cuttable. It doesn't make the deck much better, but it adds a few percentage points. And there it goes. Magus the Library. Surprisingly one of the few decks that can use this. Because you want to keep a relatively full hand, this keeping you in gas is good. And at the very worst, it's a two mana, um, mana dork. So this does a lot of things that the deck wants. It gives extra mana when needed, but also it can keep you into an eighth card very often. I usually get four or five cards out of this in a given game. But notice it says exactly seven. So if you have eight cards, you have to play one, then activate. Nantuku Cultivator, the simple, everyone says, well, what do you do with, you know, if you get stuck with a bunch of lands in your hand? If you have seven lands in your hand and you just want to make a ton of mana, you know, you can 
activate this guy right after, draw five, six, you know, plus cards. It is not the greatest ever, but being able to draw cards in that stall is very important. Don't don't feel bad if you're only pitching three. You just need to keep in gas. Hard cost. 2-2 two, two, doesn't matter. The fact that it gets to blow up a land enchantment or artifact, basically keep them off their plan. It doesn't even matter what you're blowing up, whether it's a uh, Pendrel Valley, which you're likely not going to see unless they have proxies, but um, any of the key any of the key artifact components for any deck that has like either a prison aspect or some sort of combo piece, this is just there to keep them off balance. It's not there to win the game, it's there to keep them off balance. Rowan, you draw. You reveal the first card you draw during your draw step. If it's a basic land, which is a decent chance of being 46%, you can draw an extra card. That's fun. Now, if you feed that into abundance, because with this in play, it just says the first card you draw. If you draw and you say, I want to draw a land, you draw your basic. That will trigger this. You draw again, and then you can choose. There, that one goes. You can then choose whether or not you want uh, the abundance to get you another land if you needed it for... Um, Saseya, or if you need business, because very often this is here to keep you either drawing lands or to keep you not drawing lands. It does exactly as it was designed to do. I'm not trying to break it with Sylvan Library. Into the Wilds, it's cuttable, it's playable. It basically is the um, Courier of Crufix uh, enchantment version. Beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library. If it's a land, you may put it in the battlefield. It doesn't put it in play tapped. It basically just lets you go a little bit deeper. It's good it's not great it's playable it's you know you don't have to rack your brain over whether or not you need to get this if you have it awesome if not eh whatever so guys touch if you don't know what this does it's an old card from the dark it's basically a mono green budget exploration you can play an additional land as long as it's a basic forest. Well, we have a high count of that. This can also be sacrificed as well for two green if needed. So if you want an exploration, you want to be playing extra lands, this is your card. You can get these for about a buck or give or take. How do we get some more lands into our hand? That is a key part of this deck. Horizon Spellbomb. One to play, two to sack. If you throw in an extra green, you draw a card. You generally want to be using that ability, but if you're desperate and you just need that seventh land, go ahead, crack that. It's not great, but you'll see many bad cards make this deck work. Uh, Elfham Sanctuary, it basically comes down to, you'll read there, during your upkeep, you choose just to go find a basic land, put it in your hand, uh, and then you skip your draw step. If you need, if you're on five lands, two turns of this will get you what you need for Sasea. There are many times, but you need to keep in lands. Finds you two lands. Finds you one land. It's repeatable. Thematic Compass is basically a backup. Yes, it flips into, you know, a sort of maze of if. That part doesn't matter. It's more the fact you want a backup Journeyer's Kite. You want to keep finding those basics. In green, basically drawing a land out of your deck is basically like drawing an extra card. So it keeps you sort of in business and thinning. Here is why I don't like a lot of X spells. Mind you, this card is good. Uh, but it's, it's, it, it, says you reveal the top x card of your library put any non-land permits with converted mana cost x or less well if they have x in the cost and they're you know if they're your regular hydras they're going to come in as zero zeros they don't matter this is so good it's absolutely worth playing uh that will also be extremely similar and i will bring it up with genesis wave so Genesis Wave is reveal top X card of your library, put any number of permanents with converted mana cost X or less. That includes lands. That's why the embodiment of insight matters. Uh, this one says non-land. This one just says permanent. So this one will get the lands. This guy obviously is going to also come in as an XX. So that's matter. That's why I keep saying about hard cost on creatures. It's very important for those sorts of things. Uh, Polycaranos. Yes, I can't pronounce it. It's a made up, you know, Greek sounding name. Big thing here is XX green. It becomes huge, and then you can deal X. It's it's X damage amongst any number of creatures, basically killing them, and they're going to fire back. Most likely, this one's going to die. But if you need a one-sided-ish board wipe, this one is you know your creature. The fact that it comes in, it has a hard cost. It's coming in off Genesis Wave, coming off Genesis Hydra. Not a good card. However, these sorts of things are necessary. Two drop gets a land, puts on top, so you can draw a land. Useful early, probably total terrible later. However, it combos with Rowan, it combos with that uh, Wilds card. Realm Seeker. Big part here is it's coming in 
as uh, Tonal cards and all players' hand. They're probably going to have a lot of cards, so this guy's coming in huge. You can remove counters to find lands from your deck. You don't have any broken lands, and you maybe go off, you find uh, Reliquary Tower. Big thing here, though, is it's going to come in big, and it can thin lands out of your deck. So if you need to find Business Slayer, you need to find a specific card, deck thinning is an option. This is probably the most costly card in the deck. This is about, I think, the last time I checked, 850, because people are using it as a commander, because it is a creature that can become a Planeswalker. Right now, just look what it does. It goes off, it finds a forest card, and you put it into your hand. Not good. Uh, whenever a land comes into play, uh, if you have seven more lands, you exile her and bring her back. And this is why people were playing her, because you're basically able to play a Planeswalker as a commander. Real top card of your library, if it's a land, put it in your hand, otherwise, sorry, put it into the battlefield, otherwise put it in your hand. This thing basically just doesn't miss. That's awesome. Making a 4-4, generally not going to care. I've made it once if I need a blocker or whatever else. Here on the bottom, uh, up to six lands become 6-6 six, six elementals. Notice it does not say they give haste, and uh, they're still lands. So this will play well with our land creatures matters package. If you're not going to get this, which at 850, I... I can't really say you can or you can't, but it works out great in this deck. If you're not going to get this, I'd cut that Advocate, uh, wherever it was. I'll find it later. But um, because the Advocate very much is all about whether or not you have creatures. So if you're not going to run Nyssa, I will probably cut him to, you know, make some space and everything else. Corrosion Tusker. You're, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say generally. Almost never you're going to play as a 6-5, however, off a of Genesis Wave, whatever, 6-5 is fine. The big thing here is you're cycling, you're getting a basic, putting it into your hand, then you're drawing a card. In that order, you get the basic first, then you get the card. So you're going to get the land first. This guy is essentially good for two lands and hopefully a third. That's all I have to say there. Rites of Spring, arguably one of the most important land searches because you discard any number of cards to go get basic lands. Now... You can even discard lands from your hand to go get more basic lands, and that tactic will come up more often than not, just as sort of a deck-thinning operation. Journey of Discovery. You're mostly using this as a three-mana go get two basics. You can play two additional, depending on what phase of the game you're in, and obviously for six you can do both. Cultivate. Gets you one in the hand, one in play. That kind of matters. Gets you two in the hand. Gets you three in the hand. Depends. Gets you one hand, one in play, or it gets you um, two in the two in the hand and one into play. It it, it triggers various points in the game. The big thing is it's a backup to uh, cultivate. That's all. So instead of Kudama's Reach, you run this as Pilgrimage because it's just better in this deck since you're getting farce anyway. Sprouting Vines. Obviously, big part here is that it's an instant. So let's just say you have a six card. Sorry, a seven card hand. You have. Five or six lands, sprouting vines. Your opponent plays two spells, whatever you play this at the end of you know, at the end of their turn, you get two, three, or more lands. You'll get um to say you flipped almost instantly. This is an important card. I think the rights of spring is a little bit better, but this is still important. Now let's go into the last couple. These are sort of like utility and a couple big things. Uh, Root Awakening here. The big part is usually untapping all your lands, because five mana isn't much. One land will make that or more. Turning your extra lands into two twos, you'll know when the time is right, obviously with the entwined cost, but you're going to use it many times just to generate another huge swing of mana. Wave of Vitriol. Uh, really quickly, you're, I'm going to get uh, flack for the fact that, okay, it blows up your own stuff. You, you're you not going to play it all the time. You're playing it because you are trying to, notice it says sacrifice, which means indestructibles get sacrificed. Very important here. The main point is you're using this to board wipe Anyone who has uh, an enchantment-based prison, anyone who has an artifact-based combo or artifact-based uh, prison, you are, this is an out. You don't have many outs in green that can get rid of indestructibles, and this can because that's Sacrifice Clause. This is another win con. You're going to place, now you're going to get smaller worms because you're putting some mana into that buyback, but being able to, you know, once, you know, once, twice a turn make an XX, absolutely good backup. I know the X is going to kill it. It happens. We'll come back to this in a second. Here is a kill con. Because you deal to all players, again, you're picking this over Hurricane because of it being instant. Primal Command, this is a utility. Shuffling your graveyard in your library might be important. Searching for a creature might be important. Everything on here is good, and getting to pick two is somewhat necessary. Utility. That's simply it. Utility. I'm generally not blowing up Planeswalkers. I can. This is more just a concession of the fact that I don't know every Planeswalker in the game. This is here in case you need to do it, because there are a few that can mess you if they get to an ultimate. So if they're one, you know, if they're one step away, blow up a Planeswalker, but save this until you need it. 
Drawing three cards. Needed. Great Aurora. This literally is the reason I play Saseya. I'm not making that up. This is like, if, if you, everyone sometimes will pick out one key card, this one is the reason I play it. Each player shuffles all cards from their hand and all permanents they own into their library. Notice the graveyard is not mentioned here, which means you're resetting the graveyards are staying set aside. So if you're late in the game and your graveyard is full of spells, you're likely to hit just a lot of lands and creatures. Uh, then you draw that many cards. For us, with the tokens and everything else, you might draw a ton of cards, so you need to count very carefully so you don't deck yourself. That's also why I run Primal Command, is for the um, graveyard shuffling. So if I combo the two, I'll shuffle my graveyard into my library so that this won't deck me. That is half the reason this card is here. And then you can play any number, all players can play any number of lands that they draw, and then this is exile. So this is a one time, but this will absolutely shut the game down. Why this is coming up uh, in my in my plays? Once this resolves, you're generally hard resetting the board. So their Dark Steel Colossus, Blight Steel, whatever, is only worth possibly one land. That is devastating, and because you're doing it on your turn, if you have something like uh, the Embodiment of Spring or whatever, uh, sorry, Embodiment of Insight, <coughs> where they give lands haste. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, but. You also have da 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 da. They can make tokens out of nowhere, tokens out of nowhere, because these will be in your hand. That's why the multi kicker works out. They can be monstrous again. Um, uh, the waker. Uh, I totally got. I totally lost the waker. Anyway, but um, yeah, it's gone. But the whole point here is you'll play a bunch of lands. Most likely, you're going to play all but seven because. Uh, sorry, wrong card. This will be put into exile because of the new clause where if it gets shuffled, you may put it into exile. You put this back in exile. You pay the mana, bring it back, seven lands in hand, flip. You're basically right back where you started. Everyone else is not. They have lost artifacts. They've lost enchantments. They've lost creatures. This is awesome. This is literally, if you're going to play Saseya, play the Great Aurora. That's just kind of my, you know, view on things. So as far as what four cards I would cut... If I'm if I'm trying to play budget, I you know you 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 cut easy ones. You you cut Kamal. You cut uh, you can possibly cut Master Cortigo with that. You cut uh, Nissa. I mean Nissa and Kamal combined right there are over fifteen dollars. So if you want to start you know making deep cuts for money, absolutely. Um, so like there's fifteen. If you're cutting Kamal, I might cut Master Core. If you're not in interested. In the Storm Cauldron, you cut Storm Cauldron and you throw in Horn of Greed with that. I mean, there's five cards right there. A lot of this deck is designed to be synergistic. There, you're basically in three phases of the game. There is, I played this, I haven't flipped it yet. Okay, once you flip it, the game changes. Once you flip it now, you need a board presence, you need ways to win, you need gas. And that's where many of the draw spells come in. You'll see a lot, I mean, there are a bunch of cards in getting this to flip. A bunch of cards that find basic lands, put them in your hand, forest, whatever. Those cards are necessary because you need to have things that make her flip. It is not easy just to oops and have seven lands in your hand. Once you get this goldfish this deck a few times, you will see how hard it actually is. So you need to learn your mulligans. But I'm going to tell you, it's a very rewarding deck. It's a very fun deck to play, and most of my reason is the fact that I have a green uh, Sway the Stars. That's basically what this feels like. Sway the Stars is illegal in the format. This just feels like a mono green Sway the Stars. So that's my take on the deck. Obviously, you know, I'm four cards heavy. Uh, at most, I would cut two lands. I would not go below 48 lands. Uh, I definitely would not. Just, but You need high consistency of having a good mulligan pool. Uh, you don't want to end up with too few lands. So I'll post a link to my deck list below. Um, hopefully this helps people. And obviously you'll notice that this is a pre-Ravnica, well, pre-revisiting pre revisiting of the Ravnica. Um, there hasn't been a lot that really shows up because obviously you only have green cards and artifact cards. You can't run hybrids, everything else. Play it and enjoy it, but... This has been fine-tuned so that I have a good number of kill cons. I have the awesome Great Aurora. I have Wave of Vitriol. Uh, I have Genesis Wave. 
you really have to run this. Uh, I mean, like this is a Genesis Hydra is a backup. Genesis Wave is necessary. If you're going to make cuts, you cannot cut those. Uh, Endless Atlas, you kind of have to make that fit in your budget. This this deck coming in, you know, uh, below thirty is kind of hard when you have so many. You have to run, you know, three dollar whatever cards. And also, what hurts, and it just depends on your collection. You'll find some terrible cards that nobody has, so you have to buy singles like Sprouting Vines. You usually don't find that in someone's collection, so you end up having to pay the single price, whether that's $0.10, cents, $0.20, cents, whatever. Some of these land fetch cards are just necessary, but that's the way it goes. So feel free to look through, find stuff you do like, find stuff you don't like, cut whatever you want. This has more or less been fine-tuned, so I have a good number of fetch, a good number of kill cons, and a good number of staying in business spells. I mean, they're keeping me in gas, whether it's Tower of Fortune, Harmonize, Abundance, because it's very easy to end up with six cards, draw your seventh land, flip this, and you have nothing to do. You have to have something to do with all that mana, or this is going to get blown up, you're going to get reset, and you won't have the lands in hand. You generally, I'm using that word generally, do not want to play Sasea until you can flip her in the same turn, or literally the next turn. You do not want to give them more than a one-turn window. Sometimes you have to, but, you know, you'll feel those out. So, hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully a budget version helps you out.